Now, um, we're in this series. We're in the series on faith, and if you'll remember a few weeks ago, we got scripture promises. And one of the things we talked about is how those are God's voice to you for this year. And we piggybacked on that. And if you remember, our whole focus this year is faith. Living lives of faith to the living God. Taking what he has given us, engaging with him, relating to him, letting our hearts open up so that he can come into them and be the power in our lives that we need. And so one of the things I want to accomplish during this series is I want you to see that living out a life of faith is truly possible. And we have someone right here at Grace that is able to do that on a regular basis. He's, he's an inspiration for me, but I think he's an inspiration for almost everybody in the church. And, and so today we have the privilege of having someone that's just gotten back from actually two mission trips since the first of the year. And uh, one of it was to Tanzania and one was to a... Uh, 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 a Native American reservation in uh, South Dakota. And so I'm very glad and honored to be able to have you hear the story of one person in our church who is living out his life of faith, and that is Nathan Burdick. Nathan, come on up. Okay. So picture this with me. You're in the African bush. There's nothing around you but mud houses, grass houses, and a whole lot of nothing. And uh, you're in this village called Omboy. And the defining feature of this village is this giant acacia tree that extends itself maybe 50 or 60 feet into the air and then uh, umbrellas out, thin little branches full of super long needles and tiny little leaves. And below that acacia tree sits about 15 people on the ground, in the shade. It's about 8 a.m. and it's already like 85 degrees. You're sweating. It's almost unbearably hot. And it's time to speak the word of God, so we're, we're going to do bush church. And so over to our left, um, there's a hut, and then there's a few of the men sitting there. One of them, whose name is Sigwadzi, he says, Shia Mutana. And we reply, Amayega, Shia Mutana, Amayega, good morning, how are you? Good, I'm good, how are you? I'm good. How did you sleep? I slept really good. And you go around and there's the women sitting there and Heidi, Melky's wife, says, Mutana, and we go through the same thing. And then more to the right, we get to Unuas, who's the village elder and uh, the equivalent of my bush grandfather, our bush grandfather. Uh, his picture's not up there. Let's see. Perfect. That's Unuas right there in the middle. And uh, we get to Unuas and he says, Sha Mutana, Mutana. We go through the spiel, but he answers us, Be'epe. It's all good. <laughs> and uh, then he says, Koshote, let's pray. And so we pray, and then on this particular day, Miriamu, our, our friend and kind of like disciple, it's her turn to teach that day and so she preaches this message to the people and they listen to the word of God and we have been working on Lectio Divina which is kind of listening to the word of God and letting it speak to you as a, as a form of practicing listening to the word of God and so she, she speaks a message and then we listen to a, a portion of the Hadzabe Bible off of the radios that we've produced and um, it comes right out of Colossians and they listen, and she asks questions, and they respond, and we listen again, ask questions, respond. In the end, we decide that we're going to break up uh, and sing a praise song, and so uh, we decide to sing, I've decided to follow Jesus. 
Shatita panachana yesu. Shatita panachana yesu. Shatita panachana yesu. Quinetin say adona. Hama. Quinetin say adona. Hama. And then we divide and we go about our day. Let's pray. Father God, you are amazing, and we love you. You are able to do impossible things. Where there is no hope, you bring hope. Where there's death, you bring life. Lord, you are a God of the impossible. Father, I pray that you would uh, be here in our midst. We welcome you here in our midst because you say that you're already here. Lord God, I pray that we would be encouraged and emboldened today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Sha Mutana, good morning. Ono uh, Akanabekwa Mudigana. My name is Mudiga in Hadzabe. It means vulture. Um, that's what it denotatively means. Connotatively, it means tall guy. I'm about uh, a foot taller than most every person there. And... Uh, the most important thing you need to know about me is that Jesus has utterly transformed my life. I stand here today as this man because of him, not because of any other reason. Not because I'm good or awesome or anything like that, but because Jesus has utterly transformed my life. The second most important thing you need to know about me is that I'm married, and my wife is epic, and I got the best one. So, uh, Today... Uh, next slide. Today, I just want to take some time uh, and share with you a little bit about what God is doing among the Hadzabe of north central Tanzania. I want you to know that my heart today is most importantly that all throughout Scripture it says, hey, we want to preach the Word of God and testify to the mighty works that he's accomplishing. Um, it says that all over the place. And so I want to share with you what God is doing. That's my biggest heart. And the second thing I want to do is that I want each person here to understand that God is able to use just weirdo people like all of us to do crazy things like carry the gospel to a tribe in the middle of nowhere who still lives in grass huts. So just to build some context for you, uh, the Hadzbe live in north central Tanzania. If you're familiar with Africa, if you're looking at the map of Africa over here on the right hand side, on the east side uh, is the Horn of Africa, that's Somalia, and then you come down, it's Kenya, and then Tanzania is right there. Um, they live in north central Tanzania around a salt lake called Lake Aasi. They're a small people group of maybe a thousand. To give you some context there, uh, a typical people group in this area is at least 10,000 people, so they're extremely small. The Hadzbe speak a partial click language, as you may have uh, heard me speak a few times. Hoshote and Mama and Gakle uh, and words like that. The Hadzbe are uh, one of the very few tribes left in the world who are still hunter gatherers. Uh, they, that means that they get 95% of their daily uh, calorie intake from like food or uh, food that they hunt or gather. The Hadzbe are expert bowmen. They make their own bows, they make their own arrows, and then they hunt large game, game as large as giraffes and zebras. Crazy, yeah. Uh, they live in grass huts. Currently, the Hadza are in the midst of a significant trans transition. Their lands are slowly but surely being encroached on by other tribes. Because of this, uh, because they have less and less land, their lifestyle is slowly but surely being forced to change. The 1900s were really, really hard on the Hadza Bay. If you're familiar with anything that European Americans did to Native Americans, then you're probably familiar with what the Tanzanian government and other such governments have done to the Hadza Bay people. We've, they've had their lands taken away. They've been forced into education. They've uh, been forced... Uh, away from their homes onto compounds where the government has tried to teach them to farm in order to civilize them. Uh, it hasn't been a good 70 years for the Hadzbe. Traditionally, the Hadzbe worship the sun as in the fireball in the sky. In 2013, uh, I went on a trip, my first trip ever to the Hods Bay, uh, and my friend Charlie also went on a trip to the Hods Bay. He went just after me, and what we found was a people group utterly destroyed. 
hopeless, addicted to drugs and alcohol, totally without hope, very fervently pushing against the message of Jesus because they were very fervently pushing against all things Western. And in this context, Jesus is unfortunately associated with Western thought. In 2014, we returned for 11 weeks from September to December that year. Um, it was a trip characterized by difficulty, but God moved in like crazy ways. That last picture that you saw was Unoas, the village elder, being baptized. When we showed up at the beginning of that trip, we said to Unoas, we, we, we arrived late, at, late one night, and uh, we were sitting around a campfire, and Unoas was there with us, and we got to talking, and he said, why have you come? And we made our intentions known, and that we're here to share the word of Jesus with them. And he's like, you know, I've heard a little, about, a little bit about this Jesus guy, but I don't really know who he is. Could you tell me? And so we share the gospel with him, and he decides to follow Jesus right there in front of this campfire after telling us that he worshipped the sun. So four, four weeks or five weeks later, we're teaching about baptism, and he's like, guys, I want to be baptized. So there's no, like, water around. As you can see, it looks a lot like a desert. And so we got a five-gallon bucket and poured it over. I don't care what you think about it theologically. It's just, <laughs> it's what we did. You do what you got to do. All right. In 2016, we returned for five weeks to continue with these efforts. Uh, we found that God had been super faithful. There were a few men who uh, we had given audio Bibles to. This man right here, uh, his name is Mamoya in the pink shirt. We had given an audio Bible to him, and he had told us uh, that he had listened to it as, for as long as it had been working, and we thought, well, what does that mean? And he went and got it for us, and he brought it, and he brought it to us, and it was in pieces. And uh, we asked him, what happened to your audio Bible? He said, well, you know, my kid was really fascinated by it, and he wanted to see the people who were talking inside, so he smashed it with a rock. <laughs> and uh, we were like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, we noticed, actually, that he had tried to fix it. And uh, we asked Momoya, like, how, like, he literally, like, soldered wires together in the middle of nowhere. I have no idea how. I think he heated up, like, an end of an arrow and, like, soldered it or something. Whatever he did, he did it. And uh, we asked him, why would you spend all this time and energy trying to put the Word of God back together? And he said, because it's so important for us to hear it. So this is, this is the crop that we're reaping in 2016 last year. We're seeing God do just phenomenal, crazy things. We're hearing testimonies of, they're like, we're in the bush and we're hunting and like, we're not getting anything. We pray and like all of a sudden animals run right in front of us and God is, provides for our family food. Just testimony after testimony, we see God do these amazing things. While we were there, we translated, uh, so they the first time we went, we translated 21 stories. Then last year, we translated Mark and Colossians. Um, and then um, at the end of that trip, I really felt like this deep burden. I, said, I felt like God was saying, you need to teach people how to do church. But not how to do church, more how to be the church. In Acts, we see this picture of the church that's not like the church we see today. We meet together daily in the temple. Okay, it's a little bit like the church we see today. I'm not dissing the church we see today. It, but it, it's different. So they met together in the temple courts and devoted themselves to prayer and the apostles' teaching to the breaking of bread and to fellowship on a, daily, on a daily basis. So I was like, well, we can do that. So every day at like 4.30, we met under the shade of the acacia tree and we were the church together. We came together and we broke bread and had fellowship and prayed and devoted ourselves to the apostles' teaching. And we did it every day for two weeks while I was there at the end of that trip. This most recent trip uh, happened just in January, and God did some crazy things. Next picture, please. Perfect. God did some crazy things on this trip. This picture is Unuas right here on the right, and uh, over farther to the right and also here on the left, that's the women and children over there and the men over here. They separate themselves when they're sitting, and... Uh, Unwas is sharing the gospel like this. And uh, this is our vision picture. This is what we desire to see happen among the Hods Bay. Our desire is not 
that we would be the people preaching the gospel to every person. Our desire is that the Hods Bay would be so emboldened and filled with the Spirit of God that they would preach the gospel to their brothers and sisters. This is the vision. So on this most recent trip, we traveled there for three, three weeks. Um, we translated Acts, James, and eight Psalms. So currently, the Hods Bay have in their native language that for 2,000 years hasn't had anything in their, any part of the Bible in their language, for the first time in this generation has Mark, Colossians, James, Acts, eight Psalms, and 21 stories. And they lo- people love it. Can you imagine what it would be like if the Bible was in Latin and we expected you to learn Latin in order to read it? Could you imagine what that would feel like? Jesus would be so distant. The freedom that comes from experiencing the word of God in your own language is palatable. God all of a sudden goes from being this far off deity who I can only get to through somebody who interprets the Bible for me or whatever. He becomes right here, up close and personal. He becomes my Jesus. So our goals for this trip were we wanted to put more of the language into the, the, the Hods Bay language, more of the Bible into the Hods Bay language. We wanted to equip our sister in Christ, Miriamu. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, I'm going a little bit ahead. Oh, never mind. Uh, you can stay there if you want, whatever. Okay. So uh, we wanted to equip our sister in Christ, Miriamu, with more tools so that she could become a national missionary. And we also wanted... Uh, to do a discipleship training with the people who had already become believers in order that they would be able to more effectively carry the gospel to their friends and neighbors. So the day we left in January, now we can switch, it was snowy and awful. And this is where God's salvation for this trip began. We, uh, it, it was, uh, we left the Denver airport like two hours late and we had only like a two and a half hour connection in LAX. And so we knew that we were going to be pushing it. When we landed in LAX, it was snowing that day and that's why we were so late. When we landed in LAX, we got this email. Your connecting flight has already departed. Please see a United representative for rebooking assistance. So if you've ever traveled internationally, this is like the worst email you can possibly get. (laughs) So we are hanging out in the airport and praying and seeing, saying, God, like, what do you want us to do? Should we run for it? Because even though we got this email, like, we're trusting you. If you want us to go for it, we feel like God's saying, run for it. So LAX is this giant horseshoe, and we're all the way at the bottom of this horseshoe, and we have to get all the way to the top of the horseshoe to the international terminal, so we book it. We have like 15 minutes until the flight actually takes off. Not until boarding, but until the flight takes off. We book it, and we make it by the skin of our teeth. Like, that's God's provision. we make our next two flights and then we land in Tanzania and we realize our bags did not make the run through the airport that we did. (laughs) So we have to change our plan. Our plan originally was to hang out in Arusha, which is kind of a town center in that area for only one day and then head directly in the bush. But because that wasn't possible, we decided that we would stay and we got invited to preach in a church and um, we preached in that church. And at the end of the service, uh, the people's, We had no idea what was going on. We just thought it was a normal offering. The people took an offering and they offered it to us as a gift and it was 38,500 shillings. Next slide. This is the church we preached in. Uh, That's what churches look like in town. It's in the middle of a slum area. Um, But uh, yeah, so there's, they they love colors and stuff like that. Anyway, next slide. Uh, we, We get this envelope, sadaka, it means offering. Um, 38,500 Tanzanian Tanzania shillings. It's about $19.50. And uh, we later had come to find out that on a normal Sunday, these people bring in like 70,000 shillings as the entire offering. And so we were extremely blessed to be able to um, receive this and uh, use it for the mission. So... It gets to be Sunday afternoon. We arrived on Friday afternoon. It gets to be Sunday afternoon. We're feeling restless. And our bags have still not come. And so we're like, okay, guys, let's just go without our bags. 
And uh, the reason that that would be a bad deal is because we have about $3,000 in audio Bibles in our checked bags, packed in our clothes. And so we're like, well, we can always come back and get them later, right? So we buy bug nets, and we decide we're going to go hang out in the bush with the Hods Bay in a very Hods Bay way without tents or anything like that. And we're like two seconds away from leaving, literally. Like we're in the car, on the road, out of town, and we get this call from the airport. Hey, your bags have arrived, but you have to come clear customs because we found something in your bags that like we just can't leave the airport with it, so please come and clear customs. So we drive an hour and a half to the airport, and we get to the airport, and we say, hey, you know, what's up? And he's like, well, these three bags are okay, but there's three bags in the customs area. I'm going to call the customs official. We sit there for like 20 minutes waiting for this guy. This kind of middle-aged man in plain clothes comes walking in. He comes and shakes our hand. I'm the customs official. We walk into his office. Well, what do you have in your bags? And, well, we have clothes and tents and audio Bibles which I call radios, because you can never be too careful. And uh, we have radios and stuff, and he's like, oh, really, how many radios do you have? Well, we have 100 radios. And he's like, really? And uh, how much money are these worth in America? And I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit or my sinful self, but I lied and said $5. <laughs> and uh, $5 each. And uh, he's like, okay, okay, well... Uh, I want to let you know that you're going to have to pay a tax, 50%, 40 or 37% uh, import tax. I'm not throwing the Tanzanian government under at all, so don't hear that. But 37% import tax and then 13% sales tax. And we're like, what? And so he wants, to, he wants us to pay $250 to import our audio Bibles. And, you know, I don't know what you would do in my shoes, but we started to pray. And uh, it was not... Uh, an awesome situation for 20 minutes. We kind of just went back and forth with this guy. But, but man, we're giving them away as gifts. Why would we have to pay taxes on something we're giving away as gifts? I don't, we don't understand. Can you help us to understand? Oh, man, it's a normal thing. It's a normal thing. You just got to do it. All the while, our, the third person who had come with us, this lady named Laura, was praying the whole time, God, please make a way. God, please make a way. God, please make a way. So we get to a point and we're like, I guess we should just start throwing money. So we start throwing our money down on the table. And thankfully, we had left it at home, most of it. So we only had spending money in our pocket. We only had about half of what he wanted. And he looks at the money, all that we have on the table, and puts his hands on his, heads like, on his head like this and says, just go for free. And so we grab our money, grab our bags, and run out of the airport as quickly as possible. And God, God just crazy made this way. God just made a way. Over and over again, in the airport, here, he made a way. When we got into the car, our friend Danny, who was driving us, said, man, it's a twofold miracle. First, you gave money to a Tanzanian official, and he did not take it as a bribe. <laughs> Second, he just let you go for free. Okay, so God is crazy, awesome, doing crazy things. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. This is what our audio Bibles look like. There's solar power and then there's a crank handle on the back. Next slide, please. Okay, so this was our team. Uh, on the left is Charlie and then Miriamu, our translator. You can see I'm a foot taller than her. Uh, then this is Laura in the middle. Ima, our Swahili translator. She speaks Hadzabe and Swahili and English and he speaks uh, English and Swahili. And then that's me. And uh, we're, when we just get into the bush, we begin to translate next slide, which I think is a video. Okay, you can stop. Okay. So that's what the process of translating the Bible looks like. So she speaks into a microphone, the Hadzabe language, after hearing the Bible in Swahili. Um, and that's the process. And we sit there for six hours a day, and she does this, it, 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 like, I can't even imagine the mentally taxing pressure of translating in general, let alone translating scripture. 
And uh, so we do this for six hours a day, and then in our off time, uh, we edit all of the files down to, to make them si sound nice and pretty. And then in our off time after that, we hang out in Miriamu's home, and this is her home behind us. It's a mud brick house. Sorry, this picture's a little funky. And this is our friend Bai. And what you find is that when you have white skin in some context, it really attracts people uh, because they've... Uh, because you're so different than everybody around you. And so this particular guy came over to our camp and he's like, hey, my name's Bai, what are you guys doing here? You know, how you doing? And we just introduced ourselves to him and all that stuff and started a relationship with him. Long story short, Bai becomes, uh, Bai tells us that he's been a cultural Christian in his whole life, that he was born into Christianity, which I don't personally believe you can be born into Christianity uh, as a personal faith. And, uh, that he left the church. When, when I asked him, so what does following Jesus look like for you? He said, well, I don't go to church anymore. So his un he, he didn't really understand that Jesus desired a personal relationship with him. And uh, he told us that he had kind of heard this gospel that God expects you to be really good and really perfect and awesome and have no sin at all, and then you can become a Christian. And... We were like, oh, no, 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 that's not the gospel. And so we share the true gospel with him, that Jesus so passionately loves us that he died for us in order for us to come into a deeper relationship with him. And Bai was like, I want that. And so he, he with his own words, prayed and asked Jesus to save him. And we said, so how are you feeling? He's like, man, I feel peace. So Bai becomes a Christian, and that's awesome. Pascali is another guy. Next slide, please. So Pascali, you might have heard me. If you were here two years ago in January, I gave a similar speech about my first trip, and I told you about Pascali, and Pascali was a man who we met who uh, he asked us a question, and that started a conversation about the gospel, and uh, we said, so why, why, why don't you become a Christian? And he pulls out of his pocket a box of cigarettes and shows it to us, and he says, I can't become a Christian if I smoke cigarettes. And we say, oh, no, 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 that's not true. And our translator who was there at the time, uh, a different translator than the people we have now, said, man, these words will not pass my lips. Like, he would not tell uh, Pascali the truth that you can come to know Jesus even without becoming a perfect person. He wouldn't tell him. And so we ask Miriamu to translate, and Miriamu translates for us two years ago. The next year, we come back. Hey, Pascali, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing okay. Have you decided to follow Jesus? No, I still smoke and drink. And we come down hard. We're like, straight up, dude, this is a lie of the evil one trying to prevent people from coming into the kingdom that you have to be perfect. This is straight up a lie, straight out of the mouth of hell. And... Uh, he still decides not to become a Christian. We show up this last t go around and we're like, hey, Pascali, how you doing? He's like, well, I decided to follow Jesus. Yeah. And uh, yeah, praise God. So this, it was like a three-year journey of this guy coming to know that Jesus cares about him just where he's at. No expectations. While we were also in Gorofani, this is kind of our last miracle of like God making a way. We ran into a sheriff. So the president just recently changed in Tanzania last year, 2015 or 2016. Uh, yeah, 2016. And uh, they instated a whole more like, like the government got like really cracked down. And the sheriff contacts us and hears that we're going to the Hods Bay and says, hey, you need to come to my office. So we go to his office and we get yelled at for 20 minutes about how we're breaking the law to go and talk to the Hods Bay without government permission and all this stuff. And uh, he says, you need to drive an hour, and, excuse me, you have to drive an hour and a half out, of, out to this other town, sit in an office and ask the government there to give you permission. And then you bring that piece of paper to me and then I'll let you go to the Hods Bay. And we're like, really? We had no idea. We're so sorry. Is there any way around this? No, sorry, there's no way around this. So Laura, again, she's praying, 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 big old smile on her face, praying. Me and Charlie are like, what's going on? Like, how can we like, ask him to let us through? And all of a sudden, after like, being like, 
harsh to Miriamu for like five or six minutes. He just looks at us and says, you can go. It's like, okay, so we go. And God just made, made a way again. Like, we didn't do anything. Nothing we said could have convinced him to let us go. It was just like a miracle, the Spirit of God working in his heart that led us through. So our plan after this was to head into the bush, and we wanted to collect all of our friends who we knew already believed in Jesus, and we wanted to take them to a central location and have a discipleship conference, and that was our plan, but God had a different plan. And so we get into the bush and we find that the people who were in this village that we were expecting to be there had moved because it's traditional when somebody dies that you move. That's the Hadza Bay traditional way of doing business. So they had moved all the way over this mountain range to the other side of the mountain range. And so we had to drive through a mountain pass to get there. And we're two hours deeper into the bush by the time we reach our friends there. And when we do finally reach them, only two of the people of the four people that we were hoping to be there are there. In the first few hours of being there, Miriamu walks up to us and says, guys, I'm really not at peace with us staying here. We could have big problems. This is an area famous for poaching. And sometimes they kill people who get in their way. And uh, she's like, I just have no peace about being here. Two nights later, we're hanging out in, it's like midnight. I'm asleep, Charlie's asleep, Ima's asleep, and Miriamu and Laura are sleeping in the same tent, and all of it, they hear this honking. <laughs> and 250 yards from our camp is the road, and this car slowly moves along the road, honking. <laughs> <laughs> and Miriamu whispers to Laura, it's poachers. And they start to pray, and we wake up the next morning, and everything's okay. But... Like, God just protected us in, in this dangerous situation. Like, we have this big, giant land cruiser, the way that we got there, sitting right there for poachers to see, but, I don't know, God just protected us. All right, next picture, please. Uh, next picture. Okay, yeah. So... Like I said before, the events of the week were this. We met twice daily, once in the morning and once in the evening, and we did, we were the church together. And every day we translated and, and, and well, every day we spoke the word of God and people listened and received it. And um, then in the middle of the day, we would just kind of hang out with people. And uh, one time while we were speaking, we gave a time for prayer and this girl said, man, I have this really bad headache. Would you guys pray for me? So uh, we had Unuas and some of the other believers in the village come and lay their hands on her and pray. And the next day she brings us this testimony that she felt better and that she had been healed after having this head pain for a significant period of time. In a conversation with Unuas, uh, back one, sorry. In a conversation with Unuas, uh, yeah, that's Unuas. He, uh, we, we were asking him, hey, Unuas, like, you remember last year when we came and we were talking about, like, meeting together daily and, like, did that, did that continue? And he said, yeah, we meet together three times a week. And uh, so we're pra I was praising God for that, that God has just continued to reap fruit in that. One awesome time is uh, skip, like, two forward. Uh, that's what bush, that's what it looks like. That's the acacia tree I was telling you about behind me right there. It's super big. Next one. I'm hoping it's a video. Next one. All right, perfect. Next. Okay, so 
uh, that the first video that you saw just there was that was us closing with a song. And then the second video you just saw there, we translated Psalm 139 into their language. And Miriamu was like, she was really liked that psalm. And so she took it over to some ladies, and we had no idea what was going on. And all of a sudden, they just start to sing. And so she, they listen to it, and they start to sing. And Miriamu calls us over. They're like, uh, like five minutes go by. And Miriamu calls us over. She's like, okay, we've written a song. We would like to record it about Psalm 139. And so that was the psalm about, or song about one thir- Psalm 139. And they didn't even know they were songs, and uh, God was just working in their hearts. And so we, that was a video of us recording it, and Unuas got mad dance moves, I think. That guy's <laughs> awesome. All right. So we were there, and the two people who were there that we really wanted to be there was this guy named Unuas and this guy named, uh, and this lady named Heidi. But we also had ideas of other people who we were hoping would come. And over the course of the time that we were there, God drew all of these people to us. It was just amazing. Like people who had not been to this area for a significant period of time heard that we were there, and they came. And then one guy, Siguadzi, who's standing right there, he had been gone like what, even outside of Hodge Bay lands for four weeks. And it just so happens that two days into our trip, he shows up. God just brought him. It was the perfect, it was God's perfect timing. Next slide, please. So uh, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six men sitting here. There were actually eight. We are hanging out in the time between teachings, and um, we a lot of times what you do is you just hang out with the people and Uh, there were a lot of people going in and out of this particular camp that we were in because they heard that we were there. And one of the groups that came was this group of eight young men. And Charlie and Ema were standing over by them. And Ema was like, man, we should preach the word of God to them. And uh, Charlie was like, okay. So they started talking. Have you heard anything about this Jesus guy? No, actually, we've never heard the name, never heard the name of Jesus ever. Who is he? And, uh, we, Charlie proceeds to tell them that, like, this amazing story of God's love, the gospel, and six of them decide to follow Jesus right then and there. And then they, and then, <clears throat> God is good. And then we're able to give them scripture in their own language that they understand. And then they, it, they were going to stay for the Jesus film that night, but it started to rain, so they left. But, um, yeah. God did something crazy. Like, he just draw these random guys. Like, they never heard of Jesus before. They heard we were there and wanted to hear what we were saying. And God transformed their hearts. So, at night, after teaching and after eating dinner, we would show the Jesus film. Next slide. Last year, I was asking the people there, you know, what can, what can we do to, to make this better for you? And they said, well, you know, you know that Jesus film? We'd really like to see it. We saw it one time, but haven't seen it in like 10 or 12 years. And it'd be awesome if you could bring it. And so I bought a pocket projector and we were able to take it. And uh, it was pretty phenomenal to watch them watch it. Uh, a lot of these contexts they had never seen before. So like in the Jesus film, you see scenes in, in Jerusalem and you see scenes of like Caesar and you see scenes of all these people. And they had heard all these stories on the audio Bible, but had never connected what it looks like in reality. They had their own picture, and so the, the Jesus film really made a difference for them as far as creating a context for them to understand Jesus' story. They also, um, it was pretty phenomenal to watch. Uh, they feel everything uh, in, a, in a, what's the word? When you can feel what other people are feeling? It starts with an E. Thank you. Uh, they fill everything in an empathetic way. And so when Jesus was being whipped, they would go, ooh, ah, ah. And uh, yeah, we showed them the passion of the Christ. And Unoas, when, they, when he saw what they were doing to Jesus, he's like, where is Jerusalem? I will take my poison arrows and I will go there and I will kill those people. <laughs> but, so we just had to correct that a little bit. And talk about how Jesus wanted to go to the cross to save us. And also how when you live by the sword, you die by the sword. So, yeah, it was awesome. Uh, On our last day in Omboy, we feel like we're supposed to do this commissioning service. I don't know. What's the next slide look like? Perfect. 
Thank you. All right, so on the next day, on our next day in Omboy, we feel like we want, we're supposed to do this commissioning service and raise up the laborers who had committed to following Jesus. And so we call everybody together and we give our final teachings and then we say, this is the big question. Our whole trip is like resting on people's response to this question, right? Okay, who will go? Who will carry the gospel? Who, who will take on the burden of sharing this news with others? No one stands up for like two minutes. And we're like, maybe we miscommunicated. So we ask again, who will go? And all of a sudden, Unwa shoots into the air and he stands. And then after him, Sigwadzi, uh, who you saw the picture of standing on that side, uh, shoots into the air. And then his wife, Heidi, stands up. And then one more stands up, Itsoko. And they come into the middle and we pray over them. And when we lay our hands on Itsoko, who is a new believer, by the way, had, had only heard the name of Jesus, didn't know what the gospel was, didn't know what he did, didn't know anything, only heard the name of Jesus, heard about Christians, that's it. He's a brand new believer, that guy in the middle. He, he stands up and we lay our hands on him and I see this field, this dark field overcome by fire. And I don't know if God's ever given you a vision. I know it sounds kind of weird or crazy or whatever. Sorry if it's too weird for you, but that's how God speaks to me sometimes. And um, I felt like God was saying this, that God is going to use him to, sh to, to spread the gospel like fire into the darkness. And you want to know the cool thing? Guess what his name means in Hods Bay? Fire. <laughs> yeah, God's good. Uh, one more. Perfect. Okay, so this guy right here on the right-hand side is, is Ascania. And uh, he just showed up the last day that we were about to leave, and we get to talking with him, and we're like, hey, man, how you doing? What's up? And it's very normal for us in these contexts because we're only there for a specific amount of time, and it's socially acceptable to just be like, so what do you think about Jesus? Uh, like right in the beginning of our conversation. And he's like, well, actually, I believe in Jesus. And we're like, really? Who told you? And he's like, well, Unawas and Itsoko did. And it's like, well, that's awesome. Because that's the vision. So, yeah, praise God that, like, Unawas and Itsoko and others are, are picking up this burden to share the gospel. And they're doing it without us being there or knowing about it. Um, so, next slide. About halfway through the week uh, that we're there, we have Sigwadi come up to us and he's like, hey guys, what would you think about buying me a bicycle? And they're about 60 bucks, which is more money than any Hods Bay person would probably have. And uh, he's like, yeah, um, I could really help the tribe with it. Like if we have an emergency, we just, we don't have vehicles of any kind. And like I could get someone to the doctor really quickly or I could get medicine here really quickly. And like I could use it in emergencies. I could use it to carry heavy loads because they use them like wheelbarrows. Um, they strap stuff to the seat and stuff and use them like wheelbarrows. And I also really want to just share the word of God with villages that are very far away, but there's just no way that I can support my family and walk two days and walk two days back and share the gospel and all this, but a bike would really help me to do that. And so we prayed about it and felt like God was saying, yeah, we should do that. So we bought him a bicycle to carry the gospel and to provide for the village. And uh, yeah, it was good. I don't know. God is good. Maybe... You do not receive because you do not ask. <laughs> okay, so um, we also, one of our significant goals, next slide. Like I said before, Miriamu in the center there with her two kids. Uh, on the left is Zainabu and on the right is Ab uh, Abeli. He, he, his birth name is Abduli, which is a Muslim name. His dad was Muslim, uh, but he, was baptized, he, he wanted to be baptized as a Christian um, after learning about the message of Jesus, and so he changed his name to Abeli, like uh, Abel in, the, in Genesis. So, yeah, cool. 
Um, anyway, so one of our big important moments, right? So we wanted to translate more of the scripture. We wanted to equip Miriamu and we wanted to do the discipleship conference. So we wanted to equip Miriamu. And so we we're like, what could we possibly do to enable her to do what she wants to do as far as carrying the gospel? Because transportation is a huge problem. Uh, motorcycles, like a thousand bucks plus gas for that. That's just not doable, let alone a car. And on top of all that, you got to understand that when you give somebody something that's of great worth in the middle of nowhere, they all of a sudden have all of these responsibilities of protecting it and caring for it. And so it's a huge, massive burden that it's just not reasonable to put a burden like that on a, mo on a single mother. And so what we decide to do instead is, I guess under the prompting of the Holy Spirit, we give her a solar panel. And she can use this solar panel to charge cell phones for 300 shillings a pop. And then she can take that money, support her family, and then a boda boda, which is a motorcycle taxi, to get to one of the villages is like 2,000 shillings. To get to one of the Hadza Bay villages is like 2,000 shillings. So that was our way of equipping her in the physical. And then the Holy Spirit, man, he has already equipped her in the spiritual. Like, she is wise beyond her years. All right, so we go back and we're hanging out in Miriamu's home village for a couple of days. The ministry of presence is hugely important. Uh, just being there can make all the difference for somebody. And so next slide. So while we're there, Bai comes up to us, the guy, the guy before this guy, if you remember that. Uh, Bai comes up to us and he's like, hey, how you guys doing? How was your time in the bush? It was awesome, great, great. We ask him, you know, what's Jesus been doing in your life since we've been gone? He's like, well, I've been reading the Bible a lot and listening to the Bible, and I really feel like God is teaching me stuff. And we're like, what is he teaching you? And he said, well, for instance, you know how Jesus heals the man on the Sabbath with the shriveled hand? And, he, and he's like, and we're like, yeah, we, under, we know that story. And he's like, well, you know, I think it's interesting that even though it was breaking the law, Jesus still did it because he cares more about the people than he does about the law. And I thought, well, that's the Holy Spirit working in you. Because he went from being a guy who thought the gospel meant you had to be perfect. So that's cool. And then Pascali here walks up to us on our, the day before we leave and he says, hey guys, what do you think about getting me a Bible? And we say, well, are you willing to pay a little bit of it to transport yourself back here? Because the town that has Bibles is like an hour and a half away, and then we go the other direction, then he can come back this way, and he's like, okay, I'll do it. So he literally puts his money where his mouth is, and, which is unheard of. Like, it's like, that's huge faith to put your money where your mouth is. And so we go and we buy him a Bible, and he pays for transportation home. And the reason that this is so cool is because his journey with us started with this question. Charlie, why do you carry around your weapon pointing at his Bible, Charlie's Bible? Why do you carry around your weapon with you wherever you go? So now Pascali has his own weapon, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Yeah. All right, man, I talk way too much. We're running out of time. Okay, we've hit all the main things. So this is what God did. He broke down impossible barriers. Barriers we were like, there's no way we're getting out of this, but he got us out of it. I mean, our mission could have been stopped dead in its tracks at the airport. It could have been stopped dead in its tracks at customs. It could have been stopped dead in its tracks at the sheriff's office. But each time, God just worked a miracle and it came through. He protected us in dangerous places. He protected us from sicknesses. I drank yellow water, like really yellow water, and we didn't get sick. He even healed the sick, and he just moved over and over again. He brought people into his kingdom who had never met him before. My final thought for you is this. When we first started this mission, we titled it Hope for the Hobbs Bay. But as we were praying at the end of the trip, God laid this on my heart. He said, I don't think this is any longer hope for the Hadza Bay. I think it's hope of the Hadza Bay. That like God is no longer this outside entity. Jesus is the name of the God whom many Hadza Bay people worship. There are people right now 
right now in this moment in Tanzania who are worshiping Jesus because we came together as a body of believers and said, we want you to know. So thank you to all of you who prayed. God answered your prayers. There is no way that anything that would have happened would have happened without your prayers. And thank you to all of those. I know this is like a taboo subject, but thank you to those of you who gave money. Like legit, can't buy audio Bibles without money. So really, really, really appreciate it. God used your money to equip people with the word of God. He used your money to help us be in the right place at the right time so that eight people who had never heard the name of Jesus heard the name of Jesus and six of them responded. Like, I know it's taboo, but like seriously, thank you. My final encouragement to you is this. You may be sitting in your chair right now thinking, oh man, that's Nathan's business, not mine. But I'm telling you, do you guys remember the story in John chapter 6 of the little boy who brings the bread and fish to Jesus and Jesus multiplies it and feeds 5,000 men, not including women and children? That's all I did. I just, like, this boy brings bread that's made of barley, which is low quality bread. And it makes me think, like, Jesus took my low quality stuff like my inabilities and my weaknesses and stuff, and he turned it into part of this. Like, I, I got to be part of this just because I brought him my loaves and fish, my low-quality loaves and fish. If you think, man, God couldn't possibly use me, what are you talking about? Seriously, what are you talking about? This is the God of the universe, able to do impossible things, raise dead people. He can use you, I promise, to do impossible things. Just give him what you got. Even if what you got you think is low quality, just give him what you got. You never know what he can do, like feed 5,000 people with it. So let's uh, pray and koshote, and then we'll go to our offering. Lord God, you are amazing. You do impossible things. You are the God of us all. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would create in us a people so passionately given over into your spirit that we couldn't help but declare the testimonies of our King. I pray that you would put us in situations where we would see the glory of the Lord in the land of the living, where we would see you doing impossible things. Father, I pray that you're glorious kingdom would come and that your will would be done on earth as it is done in heaven. God, that it would be done in this place among this body of believers. God, that we could stand together and say, God has done an amazing thing. Father, we praise you. You are amazing. Amen.